Okay, let's talk about functional programming. Functional programming is a paradigm of programming like many other paradigms. You know, there's imperative programming, there's declarative, there's object-oriented, uh, etc. right? There's quite a bit. And uh, like any imperative of programming, I, I really think it should be used as a tool to accomplish your task in the best way possible. As such, when we're talking about Lua, Lua is a multi-paradigm language. You can kind of do whatever you want with it. And so you might not feel like functional programming is always going to be the most important thing to use. However, I think it is a very powerful tool to use in, in a lot of circumstances. And we'll see why here as we go through an example. So the way we're going to structure this is first I'm going to give an example with imperative programming where we're going to accomplish a couple tasks. And then after that, we're going to discuss what functional programming really is. And then from what we gather from that, we're going to go back to the first example, the imperative programming example, and we're going to apply the functional programming practices to that to improve it. Okay, so let's just jump in and get started. So we have an example here where we have an array of people, and that's just defined as a table of type person. Type person is just a table that has a first name, last name, and age. Pretty straightforward, right? Just a random list of people here. So here's our two tasks that we're given, and let's just start on the first one. We want to get an array of full names of people over the age of 24. Okay, so there's really three aspects here. First is get an array, so we probably wanna make a new array because we don't wanna modify this one. Uh, we also want full names, so we need to concatenate the first and last name together. And then we want to narrow it down, and we just want the people over the age of 24. Okay, so I've already written out this example here, and it's obviously pretty simple, right? We create a new table, and to ignore my terrible naming schema here, but full names over 24 is the name of our table. Uh, we loop through the original people array here, and we check if the age is above 24 to match the condition that we're looking for. And if it is, then we insert into this new table a concatenation of the first name with a space and the last name to create a, a full name. So if we print that out, full names over 24, uh, we'll see the expected result. We have the full names concatenated, and they're only the people that are above the age of 24. So that works, right? Nothing wrong with this code necessarily, right? It, it, it seems to work. But let's, uh, let's look at another example. So now we're uh, given the task, we also want a list of first names of the people ages 22 or younger, okay? So we go through and we build out that example as well. It looks almost identical, right? We have uh, another loop through people. Uh, this time our condition is slightly different. We're checking if the age is less or equal to 22. And then we're inserting into this new table in just the first name. Again, there's nothing wrong with this code. It, it does what it needs to do. It's gonna perform it well. The only kind of annoying aspect of this really is that there's a lot of kind of duplication. Like these look really similar. And it feels like uh, there's gotta be a way to kind of collapse this logic into something a little more tangible. And really what we're gonna see is functional programming is gonna give us the tools to do that effectively. Uh, but be again, before we go into that, what I wanna do is really dive into what is functional programming first, and then we'll replace these two examples with a functional approach. Okay, so this is where we're gonna actually talk about functional programming. So what is functional programming? The really crux of functional programming is that functions, which, you know, we have function hello, right? That's what we're talking about, literal functions. Functions are pure. Functions are pure. What does that mean? So a pure function is one that given the inputs that it has, it will always return the same output. So given the same input, we should always expect the same output. That's the first aspect of a pure function. The second aspect of a pure function is that it does not mutate anything and it doesn't affect or cause side effects rather. So what that means is that it's, it's self-contained in essence, right? That it's not talking to outside data because that is gonna be prone to side effects because D could change outside of the control of this function, and then all of a sudden we get a different output because of that. Similarly, we shouldn't mutate anything outside because we don't know who else is relying on that other piece of data, and so we could cause 
what's called a side effect where we inherently or inadvertently uh, change the behavior of the other, other code based on this function call, right? So those are kind of big no's in the functional programming world. You, you don't cause side effects, avoid side effects. And to make sure that that's the case, we don't mutate anything. No, we don't mutate anything that's uh, not owned and created within uh, the function itself. So hello in this case would be considered a pure function because given the inputs, we're able to return something and it's always gonna be the same, right? So if I, if I print out hello, one, two, three, and I run that, okay, that equals zero, ironically, let's do four. Negative one, right? Now, if I do this, you know, four times, I'm gonna get negative one four times. That's never gonna change. Given the same inputs, we're always gonna get the same output, right? That's a, a, a key component of functional programming. So where do we see this in real life? Because believe it or not, we do. There, there are aspects uh, that we can look at in real life to kind of give a, give a better picture. And they're not perfect examples because real life is messy and there's always side effects, so to speak. But um, let me give you one example, which would be an oven, right? Imagine you want to bake a cake. And so assuming that you get all the right ingredients together and, and the, you know, just as it's supposed to be, and you have the oven at the exact temperature it's supposed to be, and you put it in the oven for the exact same amount of time every single time, you're always going to get a baked cake that's pretty much the same, right? That is a, a loose example of what a pure function is. You know, you, you have certain inputs into the oven, which would be the temperature, the ingredients, uh, and the amount of time. So those are, you know, three parameters that you gave the oven, so to speak. And what the oven gave you back was a cooked or baked rather baked cake right and so that is a, a, a so like a, a somewhat loose example of a pure function obviously because of laws of thermodynamics and all the other sorts of things that's not always going to be the case but if you think about it as an, like, like a literal isolated box of an oven hopefully that gives a, a good example of what it could be um, there are also examples of impure functions in real life Imagine that we want to uh, open up the blinds a certain amount of percentage and then measure how much sunlight is coming through. That's not necessarily a bad thing to do, but it's an impure function, right? Like imagine we had some function get sunlight and that's going to re return some number of maybe the intensity of the sunlight, right? And we give it an input of um, blinds open percent or something. So let's say if we give it a 0.5, we only want to open the blinds 50%, right? And that's going to, you know, open up blinds and then somehow we measure the sunlight. Dumb example, but hopefully this makes sense, right? So while our blinds percentage might remain equal, if we were to print get sunlight, let's say we opened up 50%, um, if we then, you know, waited uh, half a day <laughs> and then we measured it again, we'd probably get a different result. That is an impure function, right? We gave it the same input, but we got a different output. So that, that's an example of an impure function, right? Uh, we are getting a different output even though we have the, we have the same input. Another example that we'll run into a lot in game programming is random. Math.random is not a pure function necessarily. That's a, it's a, it's a little tricky because given the same seed, given the same seed, you're gonna get the same sequence of random numbers. And so it's, it's perhaps pure at a more abstract level, but at an isolated atomic level, per call to random is not a pure function. So that's, that's functional programming, that's it, right? Now, a really nice thing about this is that it's modular. Think about that. Hello takes inputs A, B, C, and then returns some result. We could literally put this in a module script and, and put it anywhere. We can give put it in any game, any code base could have that and it would be fine. And it should work fine because it is self-contained. And that is another really big benefit of functional programming is that it's modular. Given a function that's pure, uh, we can expect to be able to reuse it in various situations.
Okay, so let's go back to our first two examples and let's uh, write two kind of popular functional programming functions to simplify our code here, or at least, you know, make it a lot more easy to uh, consume and also expand on if we're given other requirements later on. And the two I wanna write are a mapping function and a filter function. These are two very popular ones when it comes to uh, functional array manipulation and uh, ones that I find to be super useful. Now, most languages have this built in. As of recording this, uh, Lua does not, but we can write our own very easily. So I'm gonna start with the easiest one, which is filter. Uh, a filter function is very simple. We have filter, or we give it some sort of table, and what I'm gonna call a predicate function. And basically what we wanna do is we wanna loop through this table, and we wanna run the predicate function with every value in that table, and the predicate function should return true or false. If it's true, it should continue to exist in the table we're gonna create. If it's false, we're gonna filter it out. That's why it's called filter. We're filtering things out of the, the table. So we're gonna create a new table that we're gonna return. And then all we're gonna do, like I said, we're gonna loop through table and we're gonna run the predicate function for each item in that table. So for, we don't care about the index, we do care about the value. So whatever V in table, if predicate, or I give it the value, then we're gonna insert it into the new table. And that's it, that's our filter function. One way we could start simplifying this is we could get rid of the need to do this conditional check here with the age is 24. We could already say people over 24, and this is just gonna equal filter, the person table, and then function, which is gonna take, sorry, this is people, and then the, the person right here. And we want to basically filter out any person that is 24 or younger in this case, right? Again, filter is going to only include people or include items that uh, pass the predicate function. So all we have to do is return person.age is greater than 24. Pretty simple, right? Now to get a, a, a quick Luau um, typing thing out of the way, we can see that person, it doesn't know that person is a person. We can actually solve that with generics and this has nothing to do with functional programming, but it is really useful for functional programming because like I said, a lot of times these are modular functions that have various types running through them. So because we don't know table is gonna be a type of person table, what we can do is represent that as a generic, we'll say type T, and then table is going to be an array of type T and we could even write the predicate function as such too. We could say the value is type T and it's gonna spit out a Boolean value. Now, if we come down here, we say person dot, we can see that it auto completed to the items of a person, which again is age equals 24. So just like that, we have a way to create a quick table that filters things down to whatever condition we want. So we could replace this then with people over 24 and uh, simplify this loop quite a bit. And just to make sure it works, we're gonna print it out. And there we go, we get the same names back. Those are the people over 24. But now we have another piece of the puzzle that we also wanna accomplish. And that would be combining these names together. So again, we probably want something a little more generic than writing a functional function that just combines names. Uh, that's not super useful. Instead, what we want to write is what we're going to call a mapping function or just map, which is going to transform all the elements in the given array into something else given the function. So we'll have function map, and we'll write the typings for it at the end here. Again, we have a table, and then we have some mapping function. Very similarly, we're gonna create a new table. We're gonna return that new table. And then we're gonna populate that table by going through our array. In this case, we do want the index for i in table in, nope, iv in table. We're gonna say the new table at index i equals mapping v. So that means this function, this mapping function needs to return a new value for that same index. And if you really wanna get into 
optimizing this, assuming you might have big tables, you could do table.create number table in this case, because we know that this new table is going to be the same size as the existing table. We don't know that with a filter. But we do know that in this case. So now we have a mapping function, which again lets us transform every item in our table into something else. So what does that look like? Well, let's take the people over 24 and let's combine all the names together. Full names over 24, which is really the same name as that, equals map. We're gonna give it their filtered list. So we're gonna filter it first. And then we still have just people in the list. And we're just gonna return this concatenation of the names. We'll comment out the old version. We'll run that code and we see we get the same thing back as expected. So just like that, we're able to create two functions that are going to receive an array of data and transform it in some sort of way to give us new data back. And best of all, they, they fit the functional programming paradigm. Why? Because they're pure functions. Given the same inputs, you're always gonna get the same output and there's no side effects, it's not affecting anything outside of itself, and it's not being affected by anything outside of itself. Everything is self-contained. Now we do have the same uh, generic problem with the, the mapping function here, or rather lack of generics. So we saw here, person does not autocomplete. So if we want autocompletion for our mapping function, we can do the same sort of generic setup here. We're gonna have a generic type T, and the table is of type T, the mapping is going to be a function that takes a value of type T, and it's gonna return what? Actually, this is gonna be a new value, we're just gonna call it type K, um, and we can add a new generic type into this list, T and K, and uh, that should do it. So now, if we go here, we say person, dot, first name, last name, age, so we see that we have all of those together. Now, there is one kind of issue with generics, that I, I, that's a little annoying, and that's that technically it doesn't understand what K is in this context. Now in a lot of languages, we could explicitly give the generic type here. We could say person, and then we could say string is what we're getting back. Uh, we can't do that in Luau, unfortunately, and so it's still not gonna understand that full names over 24 is a string array. So in this case, in a mapping function, uh, there's, there's two ways we can get around this. We can either explicitly say it's a string array, or if we have typings on this function already, uh, we could do that too. So we could create a function that is the mapping function, and we'll say this is combine name, or rather get full name, and we could explicitly type this as saying it is returning a string, and then we're going to do the same thing as here, and we're going to pass get full name, I should return, we're going to pass get full name into the mapping function here. Now it should know that full names over 24 is a string and you can see it's auto completing the first item. So yeah, now it knows that it is a string array. Now that's just a kind of a gotcha with Luau's type system right now. Um, hopefully it becomes a little more fluent <laughs> with these things in the future, uh, but it's just not there right now. And so similarly, we could also uh, create a function for the filter. We could say filter age over 24, and then we could pass this function into the filter. Of course, I need to move this down now. Okay, and so there we go, right? Now we have kind of a succinct combination of the two, but actually we, could, we should just combine them entirely. We, instead of doing it in two steps, let's just do it in one. We know our map function needs the filtered list, so what we can do is just take our filter function, plug it in right there, no need for that anymore. And now we just have it in one line and it, we get the same exact result. And if we really want, you know, we could, you know, break this down into a few lines just to make it a little more clear. But now it, it, it's, it's a lot clearer as to what's happening, right? We see that we're getting a, a list of full names over 24. We're creating a, 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 we're mapping over a filtered list and we're getting the full names out of that. And the filtered list is getting people over the age of 24. I think that's kind of a succinct way to put all this. Hopefully that is a, kind of a, a helpful introduction into functional programming uh, techniques. Functional programming goes 
far beyond just what I showed here. But again, what I think is really nice about this is that the functions like this can be reused. So yes, I had just one example where I'm, I'm looping through people, like a person list, uh, but it could be any sort of list, right? It doesn't matter what it is. It is reusable for all sorts of different scenarios, different situations. And the really nice thing about this is if we get a new requirement here, so let's say I uh, get last names of ages over 40. Now we can do that pretty easily, right? I mean, if we want to just really hack together that uh, nice and quick, now we can say, well, we need to map over a filtered list of people where the age is over 40. And we want to return the person's last name. And there we go. We get the last names of those who are over 40. Pretty simple, right? That's just the, that's just the beauty of functional programming is you can kind of chain things together um, as well. So that that's kind of it. Uh, hopefully that was helpful. Um, if it wasn't, let me know why. If it was, also let me know. <laughs> All right.